So we need to be in prayer for Camp Arete. Also, uh, Jim Myers, I know, is traveling around this summer, and he's out in um, uh, uh, Central Texas this week, speaking at two or three different churches. So we need to be in prayer for him. And uh, I think that's uh, the only thing I can think of off the top of my head. How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started, we'll have a few moments of silent prayer so we can make sure that we are in right relationship with the Lord, walking by the Spirit. It is the Spirit of God plus the Word of God that enables us to uh, walk and live a life that is pleasing to God. So we will have a few moments of silent prayer, then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we know that you have given us your word. You breathed it out through the prophets of the Old Testament, the apostles of the New Testament, and you have preserved it for us. It's our responsibility to dig deep into your word, to understand it, to be able to uh, put together the things that you have revealed in a way that is consistent with your revelation, interpreting the scripture in light of its uh, original intent by the human authors discerning the divine author on the basis of vocabulary, on the basis of structure, on the basis of background and culture. We come to understand the truth, and the truth is to transform us. Uh, a passage, a statement from Jesus so often misunderstood that the truth will set us free is that it enables us to be free from the control of the sin nature. And we have to know the truth of Scripture that we are free by grace and that ultimately our freedom is grounded in Christ's death on the cross for our sins. For it was for freedom, the scripture says, that Christ has set us free. Now, Father, help us to understand the things that we're studying tonight. May we not only come to a greater understanding of a controversial aspect of Old Testament revelation, but we may come to have our faith and trust in your word strengthened as we not only look at that particular issue, but look at other things related to the passages we're going to study tonight. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Open your Bibles with me to Judge, uh, Joshua chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2. Now, we're, we are in the middle of a study in 1 Samuel. Don't get confused. Last week, I started talking about what was going on with the Amalekites. And the Amalekites were Israel's traditional enemy. They are descendants of Esau's grandson, Amalek. They are therefore related ethnically to, uh, to the Jews, but they are not Jewish because they are uh, descendants not from the seed, which went through Isaac and then Jacob, and Esau was Jacob's twin brother. But they, uh, uh, and they are a a tribal group that grew to quite a huge population that were somewhat nomadic uh, for a period of time in the Old Testament, but they also had some, some cities down south of the Negev. And because they had uh, stood against Israel when the Israelites had come out of, of Egypt at the time of the Exodus, God had sworn that he would ultimately destroy them and wipe them out as a people group. And there were some that survived and were told that uh, one of the great kings at the time of Saul, uh, whom Saul did not kill, was called Agag, and were told that Haman in the book of Esther was a, an Agagite. He was probably a descendant of Agag and was just as hateful towards the Jews as the Amalekites were. And so therein lies a biblical foundation uh, for anti-Semitism, but God's instructions to God's instructions to Saul at that time often cause a lot of confusion among people who, especially, start with a somewhat skeptical uh, look at the Bible. God wanted every man, woman, and child, nursing infant, and all of the their animals 
uh, killed, annihilated, wiped off the face of the earth by Saul and, and the Israelites. And it was not for their pleasure. It was not for them to gain plunder or booty. It was not for their benefit. It was that they were the uh, judgmental tool of God in order to remove this malignant cancer from uh, the human race. And we studied this under the doctrine of uh, this question that we looked at on, is there such a thing as biblical holy war? And uh, I want to review that. Some of you weren't here last week. It's a good thing to be reminded of. And so I'm going to run through this pretty quickly. The slides are all up on the, on, on the internet. The term holy war is not used in the Bible, and I don't think we should use it either. As far as I can tell from the history of the term, that this did not come into existence until perhaps uh, Islam used it in terms of the in, in the term of jihad it was as an english term and a latin term sacrobellum it was not used until the crusades neither the crusades nor what is practiced as jihad in islam bears any resemblance to what god was doing in the ancient world we i pointed that out last time that that it was designed to uh, remove a culture a people group from humanity because they had reached such a level of evil that God, out of his righteousness, was protecting the victim, the rest of the human race, from the presence of this blight. And and what we see today, uh, just today I learned of an episode that would have been uh, very common among the Canaanites in the ancient world. The Canaanites practiced live child sacrifice. There was a four-year-old that was decapitated. His mother had to put her hands in his blood. This was uh, an ISIS event. Had to put her hands in his bl blood and swear allegiance to Allah. That was mild compared to the evil of the Canaanites in terms of the, of the probably tens of thousands of infants that were burned alive and uh, sacrifices to Moloch and Chemosh and some of the other pagan deities. Uh, these were horrific cultures that were uh, that had God had given them grace upon grace for over over 400 years, almost 600 years, had given them the opportunity to turn to Him, and yet they continued not only to reject Him but to go deeper and deeper into the quicksand of their own evil. So the term holy war. As it's used with jihad, and as it is used in terms of the Crusades, these were wars where the soldiers could benefit from the destruction of the enemy. They collected plunder, they collected women, they did all kinds of things that was to their benefit. In jihad, jihad basically means struggle, and you have many people who say, well, the struggle is just a personal internal struggle. But if you read the Quran and the Hadith, you'll discover that that personal struggle uh, goes out, outward into violence towards the enemy of enemies of Allah and the enemies of Muhammad, that that is as a necessary part of what they mean by jihad. And that again, it accrues to the benefit of the individual who is committing uh, these acts. Uh, this is not what went on in the Bible. What went on in the Bible, as I pointed out last time, is described by the term karam. Karam means to ban something or to devote something. It is almost a term like hadash, which means to set it apart to God. God is using Israel to destroy an enemy, but they can't benefit from it. They are to destroy all of their economics. If there's any gold, silver, or precious stones, they are to go into the temple and to be used in the worship of God. It is, it is as it were, as they go into uh, the land of Canaan. The first city they are to destroy is Jericho, and it everything is, as it were, offered as a sacrifice of first fruits to God. Everything belongs to God and is under the ban, and God is destroying them. It is not for the benefit of Israel. It is not for the benefit of anyone. It is for the destruction of, of, of this evil. So the basic meaning of this term, I quoted different sources, I'm just going to highlight these things, is the exclusion of an object from the use or abuse of man and its irrevocable surrender to God. That's the theological word book of the Old Testament. It is for God's use, setting it aside. Uh, 
In the NID, uh, New International Dictionary of Old Testament Theology and Exegesis, it's the consecration or setting apart for service to God, and it's dealt with in Leviticus 27, 28, where it's persons or things, Joshua 6, 18, Micah 4, 13, where it's objects. Whatever is devoted to the Lord uh, belongs to Him. Third point I said is the core idea of consecrating is something God tells us its application is related to sanctification, setting this apart unto God. That's the basic idea. Unlike uh, Islamic Jihad, it's, uh, the fighting in a harem did nothing towards salvation or spiritual life. They didn't get brownie points spiritually for killing all of the enemy and annihilating everybody. That wasn't the point. In Jihad, that is exactly the point. If they... Uh, engage in jihad, uh, then they are going to get brownie points with Allah. That was the Roman Catholic view that energized the Crusades as well, that they would uh, be able to avoid uh, certain punishments in, um, uh, in, in the lake of fire or in, in, in purgatory if they participated in the Crusades. So the fourth point just reviewed that in the Bible it's this defined period, short period in the Bible of war against a specific group, not anybody else, just the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Hittites were living in the land that God promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, he promised, God promised this land to Abraham in Genesis 15 and told him that uh, he would take them out of the land and then they would return in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. It, the reason God did it was because of their evil and their sin, and God has removed numerous civilizations and cultures from the face of the earth because of their sin. If you want to read about a culture that was demonic, that was uh, as evil as any culture that God used... And, and that's what the book of Habakkuk is about in the Old Testament, is how God uses one group of people, in that case the Chaldeans, to bring judgment upon the evil apostate southern kingdom of Judah. And God does that. And in Mexico in the 1500s, God used the Spaniards to bring judgment against the, um, against the Aztecs. The Aztecs believed they, they, they were sacrificing human beings. They would go out and defeat these various Indian tribes or raid their villages and capture people to come back and then they would uh, offer them as, as human sacrifices. Uh, Cortez didn't have that many Spaniards with him, just, just a handful, but he had an army of well over a thousand by the time he got to Mexico City because uh, over the course of time the Aztecs had really angered all those Indian tribes and they joined up with the Spaniards so they could kick some Aztec butt. They wanted to get rid of them. And, and you don't know any Aztecs, do you? No, that's because God destroyed them. Now, there wasn't any revelation to do that at that time. That was in the church age, and God doesn't do that. But that's the, God's, God works that way. In the Old Testament, this idea of the, the uh, harem was developed in passages like Exodus 23, 20, Numbers 33, 40 to 53, and Leviticus 18, 24 to 27, which we looked at last time. Seventh, we saw that it wasn't because Israel was so good. They weren't. But it makes it very clear that God used them anyway to destroy those who were, who were much worse. In Deuteronomy 9, 5, God specifically said, It's not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart that you go in to possess the land, but because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord your God drives them out before you. So it's not because you're so good, so don't get the big head. It's because they're so evil that God is removing them uh, from the land. Uh, eighth point is that from a spiritual standpoint, God looks at this as a battle between the kingdom of Satan or the kingdom of man versus the kingdom that he is establishing, his theocratic kingdom. So this idea of physical harem in the Old Testament is a picture or an analogy of the spiritual warfare that the individual believers to engage in today. We are not to be involved in violence against others for a spiritual cause. There was some uninformed idiot who wrote a, an article in the New York Times and this last weekend 
And he said in that article that based on Revelation 1, 18 to the end of the chapter and on Revelation 20, I think it's around verse 14 or 15 where there's a list of sins that says these will suffer the second death, that, um, that he said that, that using those references, he said the Apostle Paul instructed Christians to execute homosexuals. There's nothing like that at all. That is just pure... Uh, that is so offensive that if I were a liberal, I could probably have a cause. You know, I'm tired of the liberals being so concerned about being offended, but they don't understand that, that the way they vote offends a lot of conservatives. But it's a one-way ticket. Uh, they are so hypersensitive about what conservatives do. They, they're not at all concerned about offending conservatives. And they offend conservatives all the time by the way they assault the Constitution, which is what's going on with this Second Amendment stuff right now. Uh, they can't identify the problem, so they try to, to just sugarcoat it and do something they think they can do, uh, and hopefully they won't. Uh, anyhow, uh, this is, spiritual warfare in the church is personal. It's what goes on between your ears. It is not offensive in terms of attacking anybody else. And Bible-believing Christians have never held to that. You've had wacko groups that have, but they haven't been a consistent, evangelical, Bible-believing Christians. Ninth point was that this was a limited period of history from the conquest which began in 1406 B.C., and it was mostly over by the time of the judges, and the last authorized instance of harem is Saul, the command from God to Saul to destroy uh, the Amalekites. No one since approximately 1050 BC has been authorized to engage in harem. We also saw that in Deuteronomy chapter 20 that God gives uh, specific instructions to Israel for carrying out harem against those who dwell in the land. They were to be killed, man, woman, child, nursing, infant, and and in, in many cases all of their livestock. But those who were living in contiguous territories. They were not allowed to do that. They gave them an option to surrender. They treated them with more grace. It was limited to a specific group of people living in a specific territory. Eleventh, I pointed out it's the same problem we addressed in the last part of the uh, Holocaust series, the problem of evil. How can a righteous and good God allow this? It's because he's righteous and because he is good because he puts the focus not on the victim, but on the perpetrator. And in order to protect the victim, he has to remove the perpetrator. It's like a surgeon in cancer has to uh, remove that which, if it is not removed, will destroy the whole. And that is what love is. Love protects the victim. Love is not concerned about the rights of the victimizer, the one who is attacking the criminal. So, in order for God to fulfill his plan, evil must be eliminated. It's interesting, the people have the same problem with God eliminating the evil of, of the Canaanites. Are the same people have a problem with God? And they say, how can a good God let evil exist? So when God does something to remove evil, then they don't like that either. It is inconsistent. And then the 13th point is that, that I want to talk about examples of the beginning of this harem, which is <clears throat> at the beginning of, of the book of Joshua. And there's a lot of lessons there. I'm not going to, I, I, I want to deal with a couple of things here. Number one, I want to understand what harem is and why it is a picture of certain things spiritually. And secondly, I want to give us a little shot in the arm of why we can believe that these accounts are true based on uh, history and archaeology. Uh, that is not often the case. When I was in Israel uh, about eight weeks ago, I spent the better part of a Sunday traipsing around the archaeological sites of, of Ai and Bethel, and uh, previously I'd spent a lot of time walking around the archaeological site of Jericho. These are the three areas that are part of this initial uh, narrative in the, in the battle uh, for, for the land that God was giving to Israel. So we're going to see the spiritual lessons 
But one of the lessons we're going to learn from this is, yes, you can trust the Bible. Yes, Virginia, there is a God, and he revealed himself, and he is true, and his word is true. Now, it's taken a long time for me to figure some of this stuff out. I remember back in 1978 when I was sitting in a biblical archaeology class taught by Dr. Kenneth Barker at Dallas Seminary. At the time, he was the head of the Old Testament department. And I would usually sit next to my good friend Randy Price, and sometimes we ended up coming out of those classes a little bit more confused at the end than we were at the beginning. And because one of the things that has happened in, in relation to archaeology specifically related to Jericho is that the Bible isn't trusted. And when, if you look back at the notes that we had from that class, there was a level of uncertainty whether archaeology had demonstrated that Jericho had been destroyed in the way that the Bible said that it had. And we're going to get into that a little bit. And we didn't know quite where, where uh, I was located or Bethel or some of these other things. We weren't sure that archaeology could confirm the Bible. Of course, we believe the Bible was true, but archaeology seemed to be at odds with what the Bible said. And so we were, even, we were left at the end of all of that with just a, a, a vague sense of, well, why is it? Isn't there an answer? What's going on here? And there's been a lot of debate over the last uh, <clears throat> probably hundred years or a little less over whether we found Jericho and whether the walls fell down and Joshua fit the Battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. A lot of you know that, uh, ch that, that children's song or spiritual. Uh, but we can be sure of that. There have been, in, in regard to I, there has been a historical identification for many years that it's at a location called Et Tel. And then in recent years, there's some conservative Bible-believing um, scholars who believe that it's located at a place uh, not too far, maybe two miles away from Et Tel, called uh, Kerbet el Makader. And in fact, there was a group that came here to Houston last year a group of archaeologists had the head of the team, who was Bryant Wood, new head of the team, whose name I don't remember, uh, plus a couple of other uh, scholars, one of whom was a uh, really solid professor at Dallas Seminary named e Eugene Merrill, who, um, who spoke on things that they had found in their excavations at Etel. And Bryant Wood has been the primary moving force at claiming that Kerbet el Makader is really I. Uh, not at Tell, which was the previous location. We'll get into this later on. Hopefully, it will make sense to you when I'm done. After 35 years, almost 40 years of studying this, I had great clarity because nothing beats boots on the ground intelligence. And walking around those sites really helped. And I was with an archaeologist who's worked I spent probably eight seasons digging at one or another of these sites who was very, very convinced that Bryant Wood was right, as I have been, because Bryant Wood's a great guy. He's solid. He believes in the inerrancy and the infallibility of Scripture, and he has done the best work to date on Jericho. But uh, based on what I have been told and seen, I don't think he's hit the mark when it comes to the location of I. But that's just our understanding. Remember the target here is understanding what God is doing in terms of harem, in terms of why is God authorizing the annihilation of these Canaanite people group and how is that justified in letting the Israelites come in and take their territory. Let's start at the beginning of Joshua chapter 1. There's been a change of leadership from Moses to Joshua. And Joshua has been, uh, is the general, he's in charge, but there's a higher general, as you learn reading through this, and that's the angel of the Lord. And at the beginning of chapter 1, uh, Joshua receives his commission to lead the Israelites into, uh, into the promised land, and he is given uh, a promise from God that is stated in verses 6 and 7, be strong and of good courage, 
For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. God is making a promise. He's giving them what he had promised to the fathers. That's referring to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It says, Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. In other words, In other words, political and military leadership has to be grounded upon a sound biblical ethic, the ethic of the Torah. And we see this going on today in the IDF. They bend over backwards to make sure that everything they do is ethically sound. And that doesn't mean everything they do is right. They make mistakes and they spend a lot of time uh, evaluating and reevaluating and second guessing every mistake th- that is made. Uh, Michael Rydelnik's son uh, went over and served two years in the IDF, and he told his dad one day. Now, most of you know Rydelnik, he's the head of the Jewish Studies Department at Moody Bible Institute. Told his dad, he said, This has got to be the most ethical army in the world. It is amazing how much time they spend analyzing the ethics of every decision that they make. Uh, that's, that, that's the Jewish heritage. That's the heritage from the Old Testament, uh, that, that you are grounding everything on the law. And that's what God says to, to, to Joshua. This book of the law shall not depart from you. You're going to obey the law to the letter because this is going to be a, a special kind of war. It is a war related to the holiness of God. Okay, then we get down to uh, the second half of the first chapter. Joshua gives passes on the orders, God's instructions to the people. And then he basically calls upon them, uh, uh, are you going to obey it? Are you going to do what the Lord says to do? And we get into verses 16 through 18, and I just, just briefly, they answered Joshua, and they said, first of all, all that you command us, we will do. In other words, they understood the commands and are saying they're committed, everything that you say to do, we'll do, and we'll go wherever you send us to go. And then verse 18, they said, whoever rebels, whoever disobeys you. Now that's important because you're going to have this big episode of an individual disobedience when we get to Joshua chapter 7. And they said, whoever rebels against your command and doesn't heed your words, you know, all that you command him shall be put to death. It's the death penalty for anybody who doesn't obey everything down to the minutia, crossing every T, dotting every I. If somebody leaves a little kitten alive, then they're worthy of the death penalty. They all understood that. They understand the law. They understand what God's expectation was. So then God brings the people together, uh, Joshua brings the people together, and he takes them across the Jordan. And as they are to engage in this, this harem war, they are led by the Ark of the Covenant, indicating that God is leading them, and they are led by the priests who are carrying uh, the Ark of the Covenant. They cross over the Jordan, and <clears throat> before they cross over the Jordan, Uh, The people are told in verse 5, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. They are to be spiritually and and ritually purified before they go into war. And this uh, this was something they were to do. It was something serious. It wasn't, they weren't engaged in this because they were angry, because they were uh, executing some kind of vendetta against the Canaanites or trying to steal their land. They were doing this as we read the text of Scripture because God is using them to punish, uh, punish people. Now, of course, liberals can come along, liberal theologians can come along and say, well, you know, God really doesn't exist. That's just what they thought. You know, it's too bad they're not figments of God's imagination as well. But they, they, if, if you're going to argue like that, then you can't, argue, you can't talk about anything because because you're denying the ultimate reality of of everything. So, they cross the the Jordan. They set up a memorial stone of 12 uncut stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel so that this will stand as a memorial for coming generations. And then they have to do something else related to spiritual uh, ritual purification. The males over the age of 14 have to be circumcised because they've had a whole generation that has not been circumcised. 
And circumcision isn't the sign of the Mosaic Covenant. It's the sign of the Abrahamic Covenant. And this shows that they are being set apart to God in terms of God's promise to Abraham. And what did God promise Abraham? I'm going to give you this land. It goes back to that promise. Now, if they're going to take the land, they have to do it according to God's rules and God's law, God's instruction, the Torah. So in Joshua 5, uh, 2 and 3, they're to make flint knives for themselves. And in conversations, I've learned that you can get a surgically sharp flint knife um, that, that is as sharp as anything that we have today that to, to perform circumcision. And so uh, they circumcised the sons of Israel. The place was called the place of the uh, foreskins, and we know it as Gilgal. And that is just west of the Jordan River. And then in, we get into Joshua 6, uh, 6, 6. We see that Joshua calls the priests and tells them to take up the Ark of the Covenant, and they are going to lead the procession uh, uh, against uh, against Jericho, and this is according to the um, according to the Lord's instructions and his uh, and his his guidance. He tells them exactly uh, what they are to do, and so he gives these instructions to Joshua. Uh, and when he does so, in um, in Joshua chapter five, verse. Uh, 14, he appears to Joshua, and he, and he, that is the commander of the army, says, as commander of the army of the Lord, I've now come. Joshua fell on his face to the earth, worshiped, said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. See, this all lets us understand that what is going on is something that is unique and distinct uh, in history. And then in chapter 6 it goes on and the angel of Yahweh gives him instructions and we believe of course that is the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ and tells him what its tactics are. Starting in verse 3, you shall march around the city. All you men of war, you shall go all around the city once. This you do six days. Now according to numbers we know that's about 625,000 men. That would take a little while, but Jericho's not that big, folks. It was rather small. So they would spend most of the day walking around the city. They would do this six days, and then uh, they were led by the priests. And then they would, um, then they're told uh, after the six days that they're going to, on the seventh day, march around the city seven times. The priests will then blow their trumpets, and it will come to pass that as a result of that, that the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up every man straight before him. This is one of the most significant things that happened in the Old Testament. You would think that if you have all of these layers of occupation on a tell, a tell is a mound that has been built up through the uh, centuries of human occupation, that you would be able to dig down through that tell. Think about a, an 18 layer chocolate cake. Don't think about it too much. Okay, and what you're gonna do is you're gonna take a slice out, and when you do that, you're going to see all those different layers. And each one of those layers represents another period of occupation at that particular site. And in those layers, you're going to find uh, the trash, the detritus of human occupation and human civilization. One of the things that you find is pottery. Uh, pottery, especially in Israel, in the ancient Near East, you can find pottery, and people don't always make pottery the same way they did 30 or 40 years ago. Just think in our own culture how many times the styles of, uh, of, of, of dishware change o over, the year, over the years. And so uh, if you were digging down and you found a uh, number of places where people had, I think, the old apple time pattern. Some of you may remember that. That's what I grew up with. That was very common in the 50s and the 60s. And uh, you would I'd be able to say, ah, this, 
the people who lived here lived here in the 50s, in the 1950s. You'd be able to identify that. If you dug down uh, to a layer and there were, uh, uh, maybe you found a few remnants of paper plates, you might think, ah, oh, this, is, this is the age of the microwave. So anyway, you, you get my understanding here. So uh, this is what happened uh, with, with archaeology. So that's how you can learn things. Now, archaeology is neither going to prove nor disprove the Bible. But it can validate certain things that the Bible says as having happened or it's consistent with what, what the Bible says. But what's going to happen with Jericho is that God has put Jericho under the harem, under the ban. Jericho is going to be offered as a whole burnt offering to God. All the men, women, and children are going to be killed. All the animals are going to be killed. Everything is going to be burned. Nothing is to be taken to uh, benefit any individual Israelite. And it is, as it were, the first fruits of the offering as they enter into, into the land of Israel. As such, as it is being set apart to the Lord, the people have to be set apart to God. So it is a picture of the fact that even today, if we are going to serve the Lord, we have to be consecrated or set apart to Him. This is one of the reasons why we confess sin. It's one of the reasons in the Old Testament why the people would go into the tabernacle, later the temple, they would wash their hands, wash their feet as a sign of ongoing cleansing and, and sanctification. Now when we get down to chapter uh, chapter 6, verse 17. Uh, we read the, um, the, what Joshua says. He says, uh, now, the city, now the city shall be doomed, and the word there is harem, by the Lord to destruction, it and all who are in it. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all who are with her in the house, because she had the messengers that we sent. Now, that story was told back in chapter 2. Just to remind you, uh, Joshua sent a recon team into Jericho to find out uh, what the lay of the land was. They were protected by a woman who operated an inn, and those inns kind of had a uh, little bit of a hazy, off-color reputation, and so that's why she is known down through the centuries as Rahab uh, the harlot. And uh, the, the, the king, the ruler of Jericho, remember it had a population probably of no more than 1,500. It wasn't a very, very large place. Uh, that he, they found out that Rahab was hiding them and Rahab protected them and told them that she didn't know uh, which way they went. And so the spies told her that if they protected her, then that she would be protected, her family wouldn't be killed, and that she was to hang a scarlet thread outside the window of her house her house butted up against the wall of Jericho so that they could see it. And um, I have read that when Garstang, we'll get into who he is in a minute, when John Garstang excavated the area, that there was one small area of the wall that did, had not collapsed. And that is confirmation, although that's going to be attacked by numerous people, but we'll see what the problems are there. So what Joshua says is only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all who are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And you by all means abstain from the accursed thing. So they are not to touch anything. They are to destroy everything. Lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. But everything else is destroyed. In verse 24 we read, They burned the city and all that was in it with fire. Only the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron were put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. Joshua spared Rahab, her father's household, and all that she had. And she dwells in Israel to this day. She was a believer. She was in the line of Jesus, according to Matthew chapter 1. Uh, Joshua 6, 26, Then Joshua charged them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord, who rises up and builds this city Jericho. He shall lay its foundations with his firstborn, and with his youngest he shall set up its gates. That happened in the time of uh, Ahab, King Ahab, and the, the man who rebuilt uh, Joshua. Uh, then when he started to rebuild it, his oldest son died, and when he completed it, uh, some four or five years later, his youngest son died. So that was fulfilled. So let's look at this map. 
Now, this isn't really a great map. In fact, this map is wrong. I'm going to show you another map in a little bit that's right, but it's hard to see. This is from the Logos Bible software map set, and they actually misidentified the locations of... See, you have three places that are important over here. Bethel is black. They've identified the red dot as Kerbet Makater. They misspelled Makater. And they, this lower one, that's kind of a yellow dot, that's identified as I. English speakers often say it's AI, but it's just supposed to be pronounced I. I still struggle with that a little bit. So, actually, uh, the red dot is, uh, is at tell, which I think is I, and the yellow dot isn't even in the right spot. Kerbet L. Uh, Makater uh, is over here a little bit. So, um, this map is, is completely, completely wrong. Uh, the other place is a right. Gilgal is probably not here. It's probably located on their route of march. Over here we have the word team. This means acacia grove. And if you even today, if you drive down there, there's a lot of acacia trees as well as shrub mimosa and other things that would have come across. Across the Jordan here, Gilgal would have been located just across the Jordan. And then they came up this way to in their approach uh, to, to, uh, to Jericho. Now we have to figure out the time here because when we get into some of this archaeology and some of the things I read to you, you're going to be as confused as I get when you start talking about the Iron Age and the Bronze Age and the Early Bronze and Middle Bronze and Late Bronze and people go to sleep. So I put a little chart together here that will help you a little bit. Remember, we're talking about BC, so all the way to the left is the oldest period, and as you move from left to right, you get from older to more recent. The Bronze Age lasted approximately from 3300. I think that's off. I think the Bronze Age lasted from probably uh, 2500 uh, to 1200. Uh, that's just what modern, uh, modern periodization says. The Middle Bronze period is, these two periods are the only ones we're concerned about. Middle Bronze is 1800 to 1600. Uh, Joseph is dead by 1800. He probably died in 1900. So Joseph, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob would have been in the uh, early Bronze period. Middle Bronze period is 1800 to 1600. Late Bronze period is 1600 to 1200. Just for your reference point, the Exodus occurred in 1447 BC, so that's in the Late Bronze Period, and the conquest was 40 years later, which is 1407. It is also Late Bronze. One of the reasons I state that is because as you get into the archaeological data, uh, you'll discover that Jericho is considered to be the most, uh, some, people, some people claim that it is the longest occupied site in human history, going back to not long after the, I would say not long after the flood. Other people think it's Damascus. I don't know. God knows. Okay, so um, it's clear from the archaeological excavation that it has been occupied for an enormously long period of time. Okay, but when you talk about the other place that we're going to look at, which is I, and you go to Etel, the claim from Bryant Wood and others, and a lot of conservative evangelicals, because of some other issues that we're going to talk about, have decided that it can't really be Etel. We're going to go with Bryant Wood, and I and I'll show you why what the arguments are as why Bryant Wood is probably wrong on this. But at Tell, one of the, cl the claims is that at Tell was not occupied, that at Tell was not occupied in the late Bronze period and, and had not been occupied. The trouble is that when John Garstang, who is the first person to, to excavate at Tell and Jericho and Bethel, wrote, when he wrote his findings, and he excavated 1928 and 1930. When he excavated at Atel, he said he found uh, that the occupation ended in 1400. And when did the, uh, approximately, when did the, uh, when did the, um, 
uh, when did the conquest begin? 1407. So see, his findings were, were right on target. All right, let's look at this a little bit. This is going to be kind of interesting. Here is a artist's rendition of what uh, ancient Jericho looked like. It's, uh, it's not very large. We'll go over some statistics on, on its size, but it covered probably about uh, nine acres. It was about 230 yards in length and 130 yards in width. That's like two and a half baseball, uh, football fields long and a little over uh, one football field in width. Uh, it's in circumference, it's not more than 650 yards and probably did not have more than 1,500 people uh, living there. Uh, it had two sets of walls that were made of brick. The outer wall, uh, here we see this, another depiction here, the outer wall here, which is also called, it's also the lower wall, um, or the revetment wall is a little lower. It's, uh, although I've seen other people call the second wall the revetment wall, so I'm not sure this is on target. Um, the lower wall is uh, six feet, six feet thick. The space between the lower wall and the upper wall was about five to five, six yards across, according to Garstang. And uh, the second wall was so was was pretty massive. It was um, uh, s several yards thick, so um, and and much taller. And it's higher up. This is a picture today, uh, an aerial photo of the of the tell. And you can see it's not very large. Those of you who have been there. Uh, this area over here is the tourist and visitor center. This is where they have the Mount of Temptation restaurant because the Mount of Temptation allegedly is just to the uh, west of, uh, to, just to the west. And I've got a great picture, I couldn't find it today, of Tommy Ice and me standing under the Mount of Temptation restaurant sign. It says Mount of Temptation restaurant ice cream. That's located right here, and the entry point onto the site it comes up right through here, and this area over here is uh, just a little covered area where you can sit down and, and uh, talk and have a little lesson, and that's where we were when uh, on the last trip when I stopped. Okay, those of you who have been there nodding your head, you remember that. Okay, and then we walk back down here. This is the, this is the uh, southern the southern end, this is the northern end, and this is how, how big it is. So you can see it's not just a huge, huge area, and probably, as I said, about, about nine, nine acres. Here's another, um, another picture. You have this one tower that, that they, that's been found there. This is Elisha Spring. This is why the settlement was there to begin with. It had an abundance of water, not, no place anywhere near here has water, but this has a, an enormous spring out of which came a tremendous amount of water, which is why this area was settled to begin with. There is an exposed uh, revetment wall uh, down here on this southern end. Uh, I've walked all over these particular areas that I'm showing you and have seen uh, these particular parts. This is a chart of the ruins. This is where you would go in, uh, the area where I uh, pointed out that there's a covered area where we talked was right over here. This is the southern end where the revetment wall is located. And um, this is a plan, area A that is marked here. Uh, is the area that was uh, excavated by John, John Garstang, 1928-1930, where he found evidence for the destruction of Jericho by the Israelites. And he dated that to about 1400 BC. Now, G Garstang's not just some guy who went out there and dug and found some stuff and said, well, this looks like it could be Joshua. It kind of fits. This is a guy who was absolutely brilliant. Um, here's a slide on him. He excavated 1928-1930. He wrote the definitive work on Bronze Age pottery. It is still used today. 
Everybody who digs in the Middle East goes to John Garstang's classification of Bronze Age pottery in order to date the, the strata that they're looking at. It's all based on that. This guy was, was a, a, a brilliant, uh, brilliant man. So let me back up here. He dated it to 1400 BC. Now these two squares that are much, much smaller just to the north of where he excavated. And you see all these, uh, all, all the topographical lines here indicate that there, there's quite a topography here, quite a terrain down and up there. It's quite a rugged area. And you don't see so much right here in these two squares. That was excavated uh, in the 50s by Dame Kathleen Kenyon. This is where there's so much confusion. Kathleen Kenyon, uh, said that, that she didn't find any evidence of a destruction around the time of the conquest. She found no evidence of Israelites ever being there. She found no evidence of the Bible. We'll see her quote in just a minute. And she dated it to 1550 B.C., long before any of this, and that this destruction uh, was uh, caused by, by the Egyptians. Now, we have to understand something. What's going on politically in the Middle East in 1928 and 1930? The area is under, uh, is under the British mandate. Uh, the Jews are increasing their presence. The Arabs are getting a little upset about it. What happened in 1948? By the way, in the 1920s, I believe it was in the early 20s, it may have been in the teens, there has been discovered, and, 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 and it's, uh, it's clear that it's, it, it was written then, that a, a, tra a travel guide, Arab travel guide to the Dome of the Rock, Haram El Sharif, which stated that this was built on the site of the ancient Jewish temple. Today they deny that. Okay, but back then it, there, there wasn't all the controversy that there, uh, that there is today. So, the, uh, by, by the 1940s, things changed a little bit politically. What happened in 1948? Israel won their independence. Okay, in 1948, Israel wins their, in, wins their independence, and this area of the West Bank is now occupied by the Kingdom of Jordan. And it went from being, being Transjordan to being the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. And since they already controlled the East Bank, now they're on the west side of the Jordan, and they called it the West Bank. So the, since Jordan doesn't control the west side of the Jordan anymore, why do you call it the West Bank? It's Samaria. The biblical term is Samaria, and south of there, it's Judea. Okay, so Kathleen Kenyon, Garstang digs in 28 and 30. Is there a big political problem? No. He clearly finds evidence of the Israelites there. Until 1948, archaeologists like Garstang and William Foxwell Albright and many others clearly found evidence of Israelites in the so-called West Bank. After 1948, up until the present, nobody finds the Israelites in the West Bank anywhere. Do you think it has something to do with politics? Of course it does. Because the Palestinians do no, the so-called Palestinians don't want anybody to find this is why there aren't a lot of active digs going on inside the uh, inside Samaria is because the Palestinians don't want people coming in and finding evidence that the Israelites were there from an ancient time and they haven't been uh, because that destroys their whole narrative. So Dame Kathleen Kenyon comes in and she can't find any evidence that Israelites have been there. Who knew? And not only that, but after she died, she redated a lot of the stuff, and notice she, she, her, her dig area is not nearly as large as Garstang's. After she died, they found warehouses of pottery that didn't fit her hypothesis. She was hiding the evidence. In bookkeeping, they call it cooking the books. That's what she was doing. Okay, so Garstang is, is absolutely brilliant. He's one of these early archaeologists who believes the Bible. Uh, in the mid-19th century, you had these Victorians, who, who, like Charles Warren and Charles Wilson and Edward Robinson. These are men that, that uh, you remember, those of you who have been to Israel, Robinson's Arch, uh, Wilson's Bridge, uh, Wilson's Arch, all of these places. These guys believe the Bible. Now, Garstang said 
that uh, Jericho is occupied long before the Bronze Age by people using floors and receptacles of beaten and stuccoed earth and whose weapons were a flint. He's referring to early Bronze Age civilization there and before, that they've been there for a long time. Then when he talks about the late Bronze City, he says the date of destruction of that later city is estimated from the complete absence of Mycenaean deposits in the occupation letters, uh, layers and other details at about 1400 BC. That's when he's dating the, the destruction of, of Jericho at that time. This is what Jericho looked like uh, at the time of his, of his excavation. Now, Kathleen Kenyon came along in 57, and she said it's a sad fact that of the town walls of the late Bronze Age, within which period the attack by Israelites must fall by any dating, not a trace remains. You can't find any evidence of it. The excavation of Jericho, therefore, has thrown no light on the walls of Jericho, of which the destruction is so vividly described in the book of Joshua. In other words, it's all made up. She doesn't come right out and say it, but she says it's all made up. Now, Kathleen Kenyon was, had this reputation when, in the 60s and 70s of being this great archaeologist who had, uh, who had done this great excavation at Jericho. And so a lot of people, conservatives in, as well, uh, bought into her conclusion. She said, well, Kathleen Kenyon went back there. See, you believe that they're legitimate. You believe that they, that, that they are being honest, and she wasn't. And so through confusion in there, you get people like Randy Price and me coming out of biblical archaeology at Dallas Seminary going, well, I guess there's no evidence of Joshua fitting the Battle of Jericho because Kathleen Kenyon didn't find anything. Well, there were a lot of reasons that she didn't find anything, and uh, the fact is she was cooking the books. Now I'm going to show you some other pictures that shows some things. Here we have a burn layer. This, there's a dark layer here which shows this burn layer that's uh, dated to about, by Garstang, to 1400 BC. And that's what Joshua says, is it's all burned down. Here's a little closer look at it, th this burn layer. And it runs all through the tell. They also found uh, storage jars of grain. And it shows that, that everything was destroyed in, in, in a very short amount of time. People didn't have time to grab food and grab things and leave. It was, it was destroyed quickly. And it also shows that, that uh, these uh, the storage jars were full of burnt grain and that this, uh, this fit a destruction period in the spring just before harvest time or just after harvest time because they were full. And it shows that the city was not looted, which is what God had commanded, that it wouldn't be looted, and that the army couldn't take grain for their food supplies. So all of this substantiates what the scripture says. Now in this slide, this just shows a graphic. This is the upper wall, and you had the lower wall, and then you had a I guess this is the I, I, the, I, I thought this was what they were referring to as a revetment wall. This is the revetment wall, which is the uh, uh, retaining wall at the bottom. And what happens is that when the, uh, when the walls fall down, they're going to fall from, in this picture, from right to left, and, and all these bricks come tumbling down the slope, so it basically created a ramp up which the army could go to enter into, uh, to enter into Jer Jericho. Here's another picture of the dig in front of the revetment wall, which is here, and as they're excavating along uh, the base of that uh, revetment, which is dated to the time of, um, of Joshua. Below this, below the revetment wall, they found uh, remains of the br mud brick wall. That was that second lower wall that fell down and created that ramp uh, going up. Um, this was found by Kenyon in her excavations as well on the west side of the tell, but she dated the mud brick wall to the last uh, Canaanite city. Now Garstang says this, the defenses at this time consisted of two parallel walls built of brick the outer one was about six feet thick, the space between the two being from four to five yards across. 
though so massive these walls were faulty in construction. This is really insightful. Um, the bricks were sun-dried, contained no binding straw, so that means they're not going to be a solid. Uh, they, they varied greatly in size, so their thickness was fairly uniform and averaged about four inches thick. Uh, the foundations consisted generally of two or three layers of field stones which lacked uniformity of size and were unevenly laid. What does that tell you? That tells you that the base of the walls is not stable. Furthermore, he says, the outer wall was built wholly upon debris and as is now found on the very brink of the mound, which must have been leveled out for the purpose. A, num a number of houses leaned against the inner face of the main city wall. So it's, you got pressure from these houses against the upper wall already. The, the wall, the lower wall, is built on debris, so it's not going to take a whole lot to knock them over. Now, God supernaturally did it at a particular point of time. I'm not saying that it's all a natural thing, but there was more going on there uh, than what would meet the eye. Okay, here's a mud brick wall uh, <coughs> collapse in front of the re uh, revetment wall. Here's a picture of Bryant Wood pointing out uh, the collapsed, uh, the evidence of the collapsed mud brick wall. Uh, it's hard for y'all to see this. Uh, I've been there, uh, went through it with uh, John Cross's son Andrew one time, went through it on my own another time, uh, and it's easy to see. Bryant Wood wrote, the meticulous work of Kenyon showed that Jericho was indeed heavily fortified and that it had been burned by fire. There's no doubt that that happened, it's when. Unfortunately, she misdated her finds, resulting in what seemed to be a discrepancy between the discoveries of archaeology and the Bible. She concluded that the Bronze Age city of Jericho was destroyed about 1550 BC by the Egyptians. An in-depth analysis of the evidence, however, reveals that the destruction took place at the end of the 15th century BC into the late Bronze I period, exactly when the Bible says the conquest occurred. Uh, he has written several articles on the walls of Jericho that have been published in, uh, in Bible and Spade, Archaeology Journal, as well as uh, you can find them online with the Biblical Research Associates. Uh, he's always done extremely fine work. I'm going to disagree with him probably on what he says about eye, but um, other stuff, he's just as solid as he can be. Now, we don't have time to look at eye tonight. I'll come back and talk about it and the archaeological and spiritual issues related to eye and harem uh, when we start next Tuesday night in the next class with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you that we can know that your word is true, that we find evidence that supports the details of Scripture, and that we can have confidence. That helps us to understand the spiritual issues related to harem, difficult as it might be for us to understand, we recognize that if we believe in sin and evil, and as the Bible assumes is true, then there must be a judgment of sin and evil. And the, the, what this pictures with harem is your justice in operation, bringing judgment on those, not quickly, not as soon as they sin, but giving them 600 years to, to time and time again to turn to you that your loving kindness is indeed patient and gracious. And Father, that is to be an attitude that, that is reflected in our own lives. That when we see those who are doing things that we disagree with, that may be in violation of Scripture, that we are not the judge and jury, we are those who are to demonstrate your grace and love toward them and uh, ultimately be able to communicate the gospel to everyone. And Father, challenge us with what we've studied today. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.